Have you ever wondered what to do when things just look dire and there's no way out? That's what we'll talk about today. How it pays to take one step at a time with God. Isabel Kuhn. Today we're going to talk about the book, The Red Sea Rules, 10 God-Given Strategies for Difficult Times by Robert J. Morgan. This author, when he encountered hard times, he started reading the Bible and it brought him to Exodus 14, when the Israelites were penned up against the water, there was no escape, the troops of Egypt were behind them and with big weapons, carts, horses, they were ready to take down and bring them back into captivity or let them die trying. And it brought to mind to him that God makes a way for us in the wilderness. When we talk about this analogy of going from paradise to paradise and a trail, right? When you're walking down a hiking trail or a walking trail, you want a way. You don't want to just walk through the field. You want there to be a way to walk. And that's what God provides. He makes a way for us in the wilderness. And oftentimes the wilderness is a real thing. Obviously, there was a lot of wilderness in the time of the Bible. And people were in the wilderness. But sometimes we're metaphorically in the wilderness too. We're lost. We don't know which way to go. Puzzled at what to do next. Maybe we're even crying and desperate for help. So this author came up with a book about the Red Sea rules when he read Exodus 14. Some lessons that we could take away for times when we're truly desperate. And he gives us 10 rules and some really good examples of what to do about these situations when we're there. We're going to talk about his book and see what we think about it. The first rule is, he says, that God knows means for us to be where we are. Sometimes that feels not comforting. If we're sick, if we're in financial straits, if we're bad economic times, if maybe we lost our job, how could God want us to be here? And there's reasons about it. We'll talk a little bit about it later. But we know that God brings us to places, that God puts us into situations, and we don't know the reasons why. Sometimes the reason why is because it helps us minister to people who are like us. Sometimes it increases our faith. Sometimes it makes us stronger. Sometimes you're a witness to other people. And fortunately, sometimes it ends really badly and your strength, your faith, like Bonhoeffer facing the Nazis, is a testament to millions of people after that happened. So there's a purpose in all of it. In this particular case, God spoke to Moses and told him where to camp. He told him that he was going to put them in the sea and between the mountains and right there in that same position. Now, if I was running away from a tribe of heavily armed slavers, this would not be the direction I would go because eventually you're going to walk with water to your back and water deep enough where you may not be able to cross. And if you're like me, we worry because we are worrying people. That's why God talks about worrying so much in the Bible. And he says that Bishop Fulton G. Sheen called worry, quote, a form of atheism, for it betrays a lack of faith and trust in God. It's hard. I have a friend who worries quite a bit. I'm pretty good about worry. I am not a very worrying person. I'm a fixer. Maybe you can tell that. And if I try a bunch of things and it's not working, then I can worry. Absolutely. So we worry. We all worry. It's what we do. But God tells us so many times not to worry, not to fear talks a little bit about how God likens us to sheep. And I've never liked that analogy because sheep are pretty stupid. But the idea behind it, sheep, when they're in the fences and they're penned in, they don't have much to fear and they can be kind of calm. But if anything panics them, they run, they start buying, they start running away. My friend and I did a hike in England and it was mostly through sheep pens because England has a right away hiking things. So whether there's bulls in the farm whether there's cows in the farm, whether there's sheep in the farm. And so you walk in. So a lot of times we walked into these sheep pens, you know, and there's sheep on all sides of us. And it was so funny because I'm a pretty good person with animals. Typically animals kind of like me. And boy, the sheep were just not having any of us. They fled like nobody's business. They just were in a panic all the time. 
And I think when he talks about us being sheep, he's not talking about us being stupid. He's talking about us being worried or panicking and not being able to see anything but our fear. And he said that this is not a quality God admires in us. But you know what? God loves us and he's going to show us how to walk. And he said there's a lot of reasons to fear. I mean, right now, the economy is not great. Tech jobs are being laid off. I work in the tech industry and it worries people when people in your town, people in your industry, people everywhere are having a hard time. And what do you do? Of course, we worry. There's lots of reasons to worry. There's also reasons to worry when there's a health issue or when there's a family issue. People worry. I was just listening to someone talking about his kids. I mean, this guy was rock solid, raised his kids with faith and in the church and did everything you can imagine. And suddenly they hit that's teen years and suddenly social media took over and now they're in trouble. He's worried. Of course he's worried. That's what we do. And think about the slaves of Israel. They have Egyptians on horses with swords coming right at them. Of course they're worried. Who wouldn't be worried? And then there's God saying, you know what? Don't worry. Don't panic. I'm with you. We even saw it in the time of Jesus where people came to him and were worried, were stressed, were having health problems. People came to Jesus because they needed him to help them not only get cured or not only maybe solve the problem that they're having, but to stop stressing about it and stop worrying about it. Jesus is our savior, and he certainly saved so many people and was at their side telling them to fear not and telling them he's with them. And he said that the story of the Red Sea also shows about the pillar of cloud and fire and that it followed the people of Israel as it led them through the desert and then eventually to the edge of the sea, the water that's there. The implication is that the Lord put them in this perilous place, step-by-step instructions of how to get there. And at the end of the day, when they got to the place, he says, okay, go ahead and camp here. I'm a camper, and I know that there are good places to camp, and I know there's some really bad places to camp, and this seemed like a bad place. God was with them and told them what to do. And the author says that sometimes we're led into hardship, maybe to teach us something, or maybe when we have our first uh, sense of distress and, and worry about something, that we have to look to God as being someone that's going to help us. And even if we're in a difficult place, God is with us and that he either placed us in that place, he either knows how to fix us from this place, and he knows how that glory can be returned to him by us being in that place. And in the end, all good things happen for believers. So we know that in the end, this is what's best. The question is, are we going to have that trust and faith knowing that God is with us and that he will find a way out for us? He says, quote, the same God who led you in will lead you out. And we might not know what the way out is, but be assured God does know what the way is. Makes me think a little bit about when you are lost, right? And so someone goes up and climbs up on a hill to see if we can find our way out of this canyon, right? And see if we're on the right track. And the person who has that higher perspective says, oh, no, 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 it's right there. We're almost out of the woods, you know, no problem. Or, you know, we're almost there. God has the highest perspective. He knows where we are. He knows how things go. And he knows what he has in mind for us. So even if we don't know the way out, it's important to know that God does know it. Think about all the people in the Bible who needed God's help. It just wasn't the slaves from Egypt, the Hebrews. It just wasn't um, Hagar, who was a single mother and her boy was going to die. It wasn't Jacob, who made enemies of his brother. When we think about people in the Bible, these were people who were stuck, people who needed God the most. There weren't many people in the Bible, I can't think of any, where everyone was like, nope, you know what? I'm cool. I don't need God. Everything's going great. Everybody in the Bible needed God, and God found a way to help them. And it may not even be the way we think about it. Think about Joseph, right? Joseph 
was sold into slavery by his brothers. What a rotten thing. But what happened? God used this for good. He even said that. You meant for this for evil, but God turned it into a good. He became one of the leading advisors in Egypt. He saved the Egyptian people from a famine. So it's weird because we think, well, if someone sold me into that situation, I would like God to just get me out. That may not be what the solution is that God has in mind. He mentions even Hezekiah, who was inside the city of Jerusalem when it was being sieged. And what they did is they built a waterway so water could come into the city so that they could outlast the people who were sieging them. And when I spent my summers in Israel, one of my favorite places to go was the Tunnel of Hezekiah. See the axe marks of the people building this tunnel of water to bring water, fresh water, into the city. Amazing. And even Jesus himself found that he was at God's will, that he was going to do God's will, and it wasn't going to be pleasant. It was going to be painful. But he did God's will, and God found a way out for him too. He brings up 1 Peter 4.12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trials you're suffering, as though something strange was happening to you. But rejoice that you're participating in the suffering of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed, for the Spirit of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, but praise God that you bear that name. That might not feel very comforting because we know that as Christians, we will suffer. And Jesus told his disciples that they will suffer with him. It's not exactly what they wanted to hear. And it's not anything we want to hear either. But we have to know that we are with God in his destiny. And there are going to be things that make us suffer. But he says that in the end, Jesus says, Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. The battle is already won. It's over with. Jesus wins. In the end, Jesus wins. And when I go through a tough time, or even, you know, in the pandemic, when it was the beginning, and oh my gosh, what's happening here? I know it's going to work out because God has already defeated the devil, the world. The fight is already won. I read the back page of the book. We know how this happens. And so sometimes we're tested. Sometimes we're in a bad spot. And it feels like something we can't bear, but God promises that we can always bear what happens to us. And, you know, it might be frightening and it might be scary what happens to us, but we know in the end, this is the world that Jesus has for us. He will come through. And we're going to have to know what it is that we have to do. And that's what this book is about. He says that when we find these times, that when we're being tested, when we're under stress or under persecution or going through a really horrible time, he says, quote, let me say, I am here. One, by God's appointment. Two, in his keeping. Three, under his training. And four, for his time. So the timing is his. He is training us. He is educating us. He is keeping us. And God knows where we're at, and he knows what we're going through. He says in the end, quote, there's no better place to be. Even if the situation we're in is our fault, I mean, how many times are our woes our fault? We don't treat our bodies well, and then we get sick. We spend too much money, and then we have financial troubles. Or, you know, maybe we lost a job, and it wasn't our fault. But even if we did something That contributed to what trial we're going through right now, what bad thing it is. Remember again that quote that Joseph said, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done. I mean, think about the long term thinking of God that this boy would be sold into slavery as a young boy, only so that he could save both Israel and the Egyptians through famine and eventually prepare so that they did not struggle during this time. That is long-term thinking. 
It's amazing, really. (laughs) And there's even times of longer-term thinking when you think about the time of Daniel and what was to come after Daniel. But we have to realize that God forgave us, and so that means we can forgive ourselves, even if we contributed to our own problems. It's time to let that go. God has already let it go. Maybe learn a lesson, you know, oh, I don't need to do that anymore, or I can have a budget and stick to it. We can learn stuff about it, but we're not persecuting ourselves, and we're not keeping ourselves unforgiven from ourselves. It's time for us to forgive. He says, rule number two, be more concerned about God's glory than for your own relief. And what that means is that all the times when God helps people, he talks about it being for his glory. And the glory, what that gets him, it's not some conceited, self-centered, oh, look at me, I'm glory. When God has glory, when he has relieved us from something, it brings more people to him. Think about when he was traveling in the wilderness and as people heard of the miracles he was doing and the things that he was saying, it brought more and more people to him. People became attracted to hearing his message. His glory in saving us and bringing us out, whichever way it happens, is going to add to the glory of God. And it was funny because the quote then he gives from Exodus is that Pharaoh looks at the children sitting there at this dead end, right? The seas behind them, they are stuck. And Pharaoh's like, look at them. They are idiots. He says, quote, they are bewildered by the land, meaning they don't know what they're doing. They just walked into a trap. And so the way that God saved them was walking them into a trap only so the saving of the people could be spectacular. And that was the testament to God. And God said, I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And the idea is not because he's trying again to be arrogant about it. He was trying to impress on people who were worshiping a false god. I'm God. Pay attention to me. Watch what's going to happen next. And that's what the glory of God, of him saving people in a spectacular way, did for his people. He says that typically when we get in trouble, we're all like, why me? Why did this happen? Oh, no, what's going to happen next? We ask all these questions about the suffering that we're going through. And I didn't mean to make light of it because sometimes it's very serious. But he says that the next time when we're having a hard time, the question we should be asking is, how can God be glorified in this situation? And there were times when Jesus didn't heal people. He healed all sorts of people when he was in his mission work in the field. But then when he went back to his hometown, he didn't heal many people at all. Why was that? Sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. And we don't know why. God knows why. God knows his path. But we just don't know why. I was reading a long time ago uh, Prince Caspian from C.S. Lewis. And... Aslan is running next to, I guess, Prince Caspian, and he's saying, well, why did you not do this for this person? And why didn't, you know, you do this for this other person? And he said, because this story is about you. That story is about them. And and basically, he knew what he was doing in their lives. And so we can't always know exactly why it is God doesn't heal someone or God doesn't save someone in the way that he wanted to save them. Remember, he didn't heal Paul in the end. He let Paul have that thorn in his side because it was a testament to God. It's not every time that God healed people. And so we just have to understand that when we don't hear the answer we want to hear, it's not really about us. It's about God knowing this pathway. I mean, think about that, right? If you were raising children and you tried to guide them in a certain way, right? You want to teach them this lesson or that lesson. I know my dad let me screw up to the point where he knew I was going to break my bicycle once. He could have stopped me so I wouldn't have broken my bicycle because we didn't have another chain and he knew I was going to break the chain, but it was a valuable lesson that he thought I needed to learn. And he thought also that I needed to learn how I could afford to go get another chain Now think that you're trying to do this on a worldwide scale. The entire planet, the history of everyone who's ever lived, all has to come together 
with the way that God works things out in the world for his glory so people can find him to minister to people and to heal them. And then in the end, sometimes we don't get what we're looking for because it says you have not because you ask not. And maybe because we don't ask, we don't have it. But if we decide that we're going to follow Jesus and we want God to be glorified in everything, changing our perspective of how a situation can glorify God is a great way to think about it. And think about, too, all the different ways that God helped people. He doesn't cause us to have suffering. (laughs) We cause ourselves to have suffering. But he will deliver us, heal us, do impossible miracles and things to help us in his own way, in for his own glory. And our job is to understand what his glory is about. And he mentions Psalm 115, verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory. And so we're not supposed to have pride in things. We're not supposed to take the glory of things. If I get myself stuck into a situation and God brings me out of it, am I Look at what I did. I'm a cool person. I got myself out of my own rut. But instead, we want to think about the fact that God is the glory. Someone asked me once when I first did training about how I get over my nerves before I go in front of a group of people to talk. How do I get through this? Through a lot of prayer because I'm nervous. It may not seem like I am. I may not look like I'm worried at times, but I pray a lot about it. And I want God to be glorified. And he brings up 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. He brought the people to the edge of the sea with the Egyptian army behind him, and he provided a way out. That's what God does, gives us a way out. So my challenge to you is try to think of something that is a trial for you right now. What's giving you pause? What's making you worried? And is there a way that you can take these first few rules of the Red Sea and turn it to your benefit to realize that God is there and he will help you get away from whatever is hounding you and that he can help you to get out of this trial? All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and please remember to tell someone about the podcast. And if you're interested in productivity tips and personal growth, I also have Start With Small Steps podcast as well. And remember that our way out begins with small steps. Small steps.